Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions, and the first portfolio is constitution, external affairs and culture. As ever, if members wish to ask a supplementary, I would invite them to press the request to speak button, so place an RTS in the chat function if they're joining us remotely during the relevant question. And I call question number one, uh, Jim Fairley. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, President. Also, I can't be drinking water just as you ask me. Uh, I'd like to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on any assessment it has made of the potential impact on Scotland's relations with its closest European neighbours, including regarding the trade links of the UK Government's EU retained law revocation bill. Minister Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. Scottish ministers remain fundamentally opposed to the retained EU law bill, which aims to deliver the UK Government's divergent and deregulatory agenda with respect to the EU. The UK Government has not shared uh, which of the EU laws it intends to reform, repeal or preserve. Their own impact assessment has been branded by the Regulatory Policy Committee as, I quote, not fit for purpose. European Commission Vice President Mara Shevkovic uh, said at the EU-UK Parliamentary Partnership Assembly in November last year that divergence means more more friction and less trade. Simple as that. We know that trade with our neighbours is growing at a slower rate due to Brexit, with businesses now facing an array of different obligations to sell into international markets. The bill risks adding to this burden, leading to a lack of business certainty needed in order to work, plan and trade effectively. Jim Fairley. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the Minister for that answer. We have just passed the three-year anniversary of Brexit, and it is clear that these three years have brought nothing but chaos to Scotland's economy. The Tories' retained EU law bill is set to make things, worse, make things worse, hurting Scottish producers and consumers. So what action has the Scottish Government taken to cushion the blow of the so-called Brexit freedoms for our society? Minister. Thank you, and I thank uh, Jim Fairley for that question. The Scottish Government is working at pace to identify devolved retained EU law and coordinate the effective and consistent management of the secondary legislation that will be necessary to stop essential devolved laws being lost uh, should the bill pass. However, this is a significant undertaking and impacts on officials' ability to dedicate time to otherwise urgent issues affecting the people of Scotland, like the energy and cost of living crisis. The bill should be withdrawn completely and the Scottish Government has recommended that the Scottish Parliament refuse consent to the bill. The Scottish Parliament has also called for it to be scrapped. Stakeholders from the various sectors are saying the same, and Scottish Ministers will do whatever we can to protect Scotland from the UK Government's damaging and deregulatory policy agenda. However, legislation such as this bill and the Internal Market Act demonstrate the limitations of devolution in the face of the UK Government determined to undermine it. And the best way to limit the damage to our economy and on our society is for Scotland to become independent and a member of the EU. A supplementary, Willie Rennie. I was going to say that I could agree with everything that the Minister said until his last few words. Um, but, but nevertheless, I think he's right about the damage that the UK Government is doing to the economy, to industry, as well as our way of life. Uh, but has the Minister done any assessment, because I've asked this repeatedly but unable to get an answer, any assessment about the parallels with independence? We're still feeling the consequences of breaking up the European Union, and we've been with, with that for 50 years. We've been 300 years in the Union of the United Kingdom, so breaking up would be so much harder. Has he done any assessment on what that impact would be? Minister. The opportunities of independence are absolutely clear and are laid out in the various policy papers that we have started to set out and we will continue to set out. As I have offered on previous occasions to Willie Rennie and others, I am more than happy to sit down and have a con conversation about the benefits that will come to Scotland from independence and rejoining the EU. Yeah. Question two has been withdrawn. Uh, question three is not lodged. Uh, question number four, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what was discussed in official meetings that took place on the 4th of October 2022 between the Cabinet Secretary for the Constitution, External Affairs and Culture and various European delegates. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Details of, the, of Angus Robertson's visit to Paris last autumn have already been published on the Scottish Government's website. The visit, which included the unveiling of a plaque at Les Invalades to commemorate Scots who have lost their lives fighting in France, involved meetings and engagements with a range of French ministers, partners and stakeholders to pursue and augment a range of policy, cultural, trade and investment priorities. Liam Kerr. I thank the Minister for the answer. I have an FOI response which reveals that one of the things discussed during these meetings uh, with the European delegates on the 4th of October was the Cabinet Secretary repeating the claim that Scotland has 25% of Europe's offshore wind oh. potential. Oh. 
in the absence of the Cabinet Secretary today, can the Minister tell me when did officials first advise the Cabinet Secretary against using the 25% claim on the basis that it was poorly evidenced? Yeah. Minister. Obviously, uh, I wasn't at the meeting that um, uh, has been spoken about uh, by Liam Kerr, so I don't know uh, as to the veracity of that or indeed the context of the conversation. I do know that uh, Angus Robertson met with the Secretary of State uh, Boone and she was interested in Scotland's energy offer and how we promote further engagement around sport, as well as Secretary of State Morales, and who is eager to explore ways in which we include young people in remembering those who have died in times of war. Uh, I'd be more than happy uh, if uh, Liam Kerr wants to uh, get further information on this for uh, my colleague uh, to look to have a discussion with him another time uh, to ensure that the confidence of Liam Kerr in this scenario can be assumed. Supplementary Fiona Hislop. As a committed European, I am reassured that the Scottish Government uh, continues to value the importance of our relationships with our European Union neighbours. What uh, next steps is the Government taking um, to continue the closest possible relationship with uh, the European Union over the coming year? Minister. Thank you, President Officer, and thank uh, Fiona Hislop for that important question. Maintaining close relations with the European Union, EU member states and other European nations remains a key priority for this Government. We are committed to working with EU partners to support and deliver the priorities of the EU presidencies, including the current Swedish presidency, and we are committed to continuing to align with the EU where appropriate and as far as possible, and in a manner that contributes towards protecting and advancing standards across a range of policy areas. We remain steadfast in our determination not to allow Brexit nor the actions of the UK Government to diminish these commitments and will continue to do all we can to be an outward-looking nation holding firm to our shared European values, pursuing shared goals and priorities. Question number five, Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the potential impact on culture organisations in Scotland of the UK Government's levelling up fund. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. While the funding received by uh, and for individual projects is welcome, the Scottish Government fundamentally disagrees with the principle of the UK Government making decisions in devolved areas. Levelling up was supposed to replace EU support, but has fallen drastically short. The Leveling Up Fund operates in Scotland using the Internal Market Act, which means that it cuts across devolved policy. It is administered in a piecemeal manner that is not always in line with the Scottish Government's wider strategic aims, creating fragmentation and confusion for our local authorities and partner agencies. Siobhan Brown. I thank the Minister for the answer. Well, I, of course, welcome any funding being given to Scottish organisations, and I agree that this is a matter for the Scottish Government, as the UK Government does not appear to even know what levelling up means. Can I ask the Minister if the Scottish Government has received any clarity from the UK Government on what the regulations are for the levelling up funds and how they will foresee them impacting devolved issues? Minister. Thank you and thanks to Siobhan Brown. No, the, the fund overlooks Scotland's unique economic needs. It is incredibly uh, disappointing that uh, applications from some of Scotland's most deprived areas have been unsuccessful and that our rural communities uh, have also lost out. The UK Government promised Brexit would bring a simpler, more streamlined funding system to support regional economic development. Thus far, the new system delivers less money uh, for project projects, decreased powers for devolved governments and more bureaucracy and delays for regional partners. In bypassing the Scottish Government, the UK Government has introduced policy incoherence and duplication into the devolved system and is failing to ensure that their interventions align with regeneration policy here in Scotland. And supplementary, Donald Cameron. Thank you. Um, the question was, of course, about the impact on culture organisations in Scotland. And when it comes to the actions of the Scottish Government, the real danger to the future of cultural organisations in Scotland is, of course, the SNP Green Government's 10% cut to Creative Scotland's budget, endangering the future of 60 of our cultural organisation, organisations and 5,000 jobs. So, Minister, will you now reconsider those planned cuts to Creative Scotland's budget? 
Minister. I thank Donald Cameron for that question. The, uh, the, the major threat to cultural institutions uh, in Scotland and elsewhere in the UK is the UK government cutting back on uh, the, the COVID recovery funding, on uh, not getting a grip uh, on inflation and spiralling energy costs, uh, and also Brexit, which is making it more difficult for our organisations to be able to recruit the talent that they need. This is not uh, just uh, an isolated issue here in Scotland, but has been raised at Prime Minister's questions uh, today, where a Conservative uh, member of Parliament was questioning the Prime Minister about cultural organisations and spending uh, in England. So I'll take no lessons from the Conservatives about how to run uh, cultural organisations here in Scotland. Question number six, not lodged. Question seven, Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on when it will start publishing information collected via Scotland's Census of 2022. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. The National Records of Scotland are currently consulting with data users to ensure that census outputs are accessible and provided in a format which meets the needs of census data users. The consultation was made available to users on the 12th of October 22, and since launching, National Records of Scotland have received responses from users in central and local government, academic institutions, charity organisations and users responding in a personal capacity. Once the consultation closes, NRS will review all responses and finalise plans for publishing census outputs based on the feedback received. A summary report will subsequently be published on the Scotland's census website. Census data collection phases uh, concluded in uh, the autumn, and as previously noted, NRS are planning to publish the first census outputs approximately a year after conclusion of the census data collection phases. The first outputs will be rounded uh, population estimates at national and local authority level by age and sex. Edward Mayne. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as a veteran, I welcome last year's census uh, in that it included for the first time a question on former service in the armed forces. Can the Cabinet say, or can you confirm, Minister, what actions the National Records of Scotland will be taking to assess and publish this specific information and how it will be used by this Government to fill, fulfil its obligations under the Armed Forces Covenant? Minister. Obviously, we will look at the information that comes through the census, as would be expected, and across government will assess the data that is contained uh, within it. Uh, in respect of the armed forces, I know my colleague uh, to the right, the Veterans Minister, will be looking at that with keen interest. Question number eight, Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting Creative Scotland, uh, and I note my register of interest regarding the barn at Woodend Bankery. Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Creative Scotland, as a public body, received significant support from the Scottish Government. The published Level 3 budget for 23-24 includes uh, £64.2 million for Creative Scotland uh, and other arts. This covers support for regularly funded organisations, youth music and community-based cultural projects. And the Scottish Government will continue to work with Creative Scotland to identify barriers to immediate and long-term recovery of the culture sector. Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you. Now, Creative Scotland has been forced to use its UK national lottery reserves to maintain regular funding following SNP cuts. Now, using reserves was justified by Angus Robertson, as he said the Scottish Government faced difficult funding decisions. However, in a letter to the Culture Committee last month, he insisted the Scottish Government does not make funding allocation decisions by reference to reserves. So, which is it then, Minister? And can the Minister also confirm what will happen when those reserves are bled dry and organisations are left without long-term support, including Devon projects in my constituency, who recently wrote to the Scottish Government detailing the real impact these devastating cuts will have on their future. Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Obviously, Deverin Projects uh, received uh, £110,000 uh, via this route uh, recently. The, obviously, we, we understand the difficult situation uh, that there is across the culture sector. This is uh, an inflationary challenge that has also been felt by the Scottish Government. We have had to take difficult decisions, uh, and asking the uh, Creative Scotland to utilise its uh, national lottery reserves, we feel this year was the right thing to do. The 
process has maintained uh, regularly funded organisations' uh, funding. Uh, the discussion at the Constitution, External Affairs and Culture Committee regarding use of reserves was regarding the funding of arts organisations as opposed to public bodies. The situation regarding Creative Scotland as a public funder is different. We have provided Creative Scotland with over £33 million over five years to compensate for generally reduced lottery funding, but against the backdrop of continued impacts of COVID, public spending constraints uh, and the cost of living crisis, we have had to make difficult choices to live, with, live within budgets, and we are doing all we can to protect Scotland's cultural and historic environment to ensure a diverse and world-class cultural scene and rich heritage continue to thrive. And supplementary, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the Scottish Government's continued support for our creative industries during this turbulent economic time. Can the Minister tell us what the financial impact is of the UK Government's decision to abruptly end COVID recovery funding? And does he agree that this has placed an additional unwarranted strain on Scotland's creative sector? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I thank uh, Kenneth Gibson for uh, that question. Yes, I, I agree with uh, Kenneth Gibson that uh, many of the difficulties facing the sector are as a result of the UK Government prematurely cutting COVID recovery funding, despite the Scottish Government warning against uh, that action. We will continue to argue the UK Government uh, should take a different approach to public finances in order to ensure sufficient support is made available for Scotland's culture sector. But uh, the challenges that we face in Scotland are not not unique to Scotland. We heard, as I have said, at Prime Minister's questions today about Conservative members having concerns about cultural organisations and spending uh, in England. So we would encourage the UK Government to come forward with the support that is necessary and required for cultural organisations uh, so that the Scottish Government, in turn, are able to do likewise and support the, the, our fantastic cultural and heritage organisations to a much greater extent. Thank you, Minister. That concludes this portfolio. There will be a brief pause um, before we move on to the next portfolio questions. Okay, and the next portfolio we come to is Justice and Veterans. Again, if a member wishes to ask a supplementary question, I'd invite them to press the request to speak buttons uh, or put an RTS in the chat function if they're joining us online during the relevant uh, question. And I call question number one, Paul McLennan. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the benefits are of the agreement on Scottish uh, court legal aid fees between the Scottish Government, Scottish Solicitors Bar Association and the Law Society in regard to the structure of legal aid payments. Minister Eleanor Whittle. Legal aid fee structures are complex and the reforms will simplify the current structures and support the court recovery programme. The changes will be implemented this April. In solemn cases, the structure moves away from the current hybrid payment model and extends the use of inclusive or block fees, fees resulting in easier billing, reduced administrative costs and faster payment of accounts to solicitors. In summary cases, the reforms simplify the summary criminal fixed payment arrangements so that full payment can be achieved in the majority of cases via a single all-encompassing fee and reverse many of the fee changes and complexities introduced by regulations in 2011. In both solemn and summary cases, simplification reduces the scope for abatement of accounts and subsequent negotiations seeking additional payments. Paul McLean. Thank you. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? With the structure, new structure of criminal legal aid fees changing, this will hopefully lead to more swift resolution of cases. Can I ask what this agreement will do in regard to addressing the backlog in court cases due to COVID? Minister. The reform package encompasses a number of fees across Solomon's summary. However, the Scottish Government was specifically asked to look at Section 76 fee for early resolution of solemn cases and at the summary core fee. Their average total payment on the summary 76 case will increase by over 60 per cent and in the other cases um, that resolve prior to trial by over 15 per cent. By supporting early resolution in appropriate cases, these reforms will reduce the number of cases for which trial diets are fixed, assisting with the court recovery programme and tackling a backlog of cases due to COVID lockdown. Thank you. A couple of supplementaries. First, Jamie Green. Uh, thank you. Uh, President of the SSBA, in response to the legal aid, legal aid legal aid package announced by the Minister said, and I quote, this package isn't really going to address the fundamental issues, which is the recruitment and retention of new staff in the legal system. Given that we've lost around a third of solicitors doing legal aid work and 60% of young solicitors are actively seeking to perhaps leave the profession, we're looking down the barrel of a recruitment crisis. What is the Minister's response to that? Minister. 
I understand that representatives of the profession um, have spoken um, a lot in recent years about the increase in fees. Um, the Scottish Government is quite clear that that's not the only way that we have to actually look at this problem. Um, I have agreed with the faculty advocates that this is something that I, I have a keen interest in, in working with the entire sector um, to address. Um, by prioritising a review of legal aid fees, um, we plan to meet with the Law Society um, and the Scottish Solicitors Bar Association this week to begin that process. And we also have to think about um, widening the, the diversity within um, the sector itself, so that's something that the government is actively participating in and pursuing. And Beatrice Wishart joins us online. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, it's important that uh, solicitors are paid adequately to keep performing the important work they do, representing people and keeping the wheels of justice turning. There's a shortage of legal aid, lo local legal aid solicitors. In mainland Scotland, legal aid solicitors are reluctant to take on clients in Shetland, citing the current levels of legal aid funding and prohibitive travel costs. And I understand this has been the experience of some constituents who have faced domestic abuse. One constituent stated to me that the current legal aid system only now provides, and I quote, justice you can afford. Would the minister say that that was justice at all? And does the minister recognise the problems facing those seeking justice who cannot afford legal representation? Minister. I thank Beatrice Bishop for that question, and it is a, a situation that I am acutely aware of. And whilst we cannot compel individual law firms or lawyers to take on legal aid work, this is an area that I want to pursue closely um, due to the, the nature of um, the, the issues that she raises with regards to domestic abuse. Um, so this is something that I'm happy to um, write the, the member in um, as this unfolds. Thank you. Thank you. Question number two, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to promote safety around iced over bodies of water during the winter period. Minister. Recent tragedies have illustrated how important this topic remains. The Scottish Government funds Water Safety Scotland throughout the year, winter and summer, to support and coordinate water safety campaigns designed and delivered by our expert partners, including Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, the Royal Life Saving Society and the RNLI. This recently included issuing clear and consistent advice about staying safe around frozen lochs and rivers. Water Safety Scotland is also working with partners to deliver an ice safety workshop, which will be delivered directly to school children, but will also be available for general use. And Fulton McGregor. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that response. In December, across the country, we were horrified to hear about the tragic events in Solly Hill during the cold weather. During the same period of weather in my own constituency, a man fell into the ice over Monklands Canal while trying to retrieve his dog. Thanks to the incredibly brave and quick actions of two young girls, Emily Dees and Lauren Campbell, thankfully all are safe. Will the Minister join me in paying respects to, to those who are bereaved in Solihull during this impossibly difficult time? Praise Emily and Lauren for their selfless actions in December in Coatbridge. And can I ask if there is anything else that can be done to get as strong a message out as possible to people to please never, never step onto an iced over body of water? Minister. I join Fulton McGregor in paying my respects to those that have lost their lives and extend my condolences to their family and friends. Regarding the incident in Monklands Canal, I can only express my gratitude and relief that Mr McGregor is able to report a positive outcome, and I commend Emily and Lauren for their swift actions. Tragically, as noted by Water Safety Scotland, many past incidents have involved attempted rescues of another person or a dog in trouble on or um, in frozen water. Water Safety Scotland and partner organisations such as SFRS and um, publicised expert advice and I urge people to take this on board. This centres on a warning not to venture onto frozen water. Ice may appear thick but can quickly become thin and crack. And if you see someone else in trouble, the recommendation is to contact emergency services quickly and from a stable position to try and reach the person with something like a rope or a pole or a buoyancy aid. The Scottish Government has included an additional £60,000 within this year's grant to um, the Royal Society of the Prevention of Accidents to reinforce its contribution uh, contribution to water safety in Scotland and the support given to partner organisations to help get that message out and promote the work of our drowning prevention strategy. I will be chairing the next water safety stakeholder group on the 1st of March where this issue will be discussed. Thank you. Question three, Maurice Golden. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what measures are being considered to tackle crime involving pets. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government understands that crimes involving family pets can be upsetting and dramatic for the owner and, of course, for the pet itself. Uh, we take all crimes, including those against pets, seriously. 
There are wide-ranging laws currently available in Scotland to deal with anyone who commits a crime involving a pet. These include theft, robbery, as well as a range of animal welfare offences such as animal cruelty. We fully support law enforcement agencies taking effective enforcement action to deal with any offences involving pets as they consider necessary in any given case. Maurice Golden. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Ensuring the law treats dogs as living beings instead of property is one of the aims of my new dog abduction bill. It would mean those abducting dogs would receive punishment based on the harm they cause to a dog's welfare and the impact on the dog's owner which can be considerable, given many regard their dog as part of the family. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree this welfare-led approach is the right way to tackle dog abduction? Cabinet Secretary. I think the first thing to say is in relation to the Member's Bill, which he's mentioned, that the Scottish Government, of course, will consider uh, the Member's proposed Bill as and when he formally provides uh, for the detail of the plans, including if and when he introduces the bill to Parliament, but I would say the point he makes about taking into account the welfare of the animal, and I think also he's made, if not just now, previously, the point of the value of that uh, pet to the family as well. Uh, there's no evidence that I'm aware of that shows that courts don't take uh, those things into account. There's certainly no inhibition on the courts in taking those things into account. And I think it's a very good track record in the way that the, uh, the situation currently is dealt with. So just under half uh, of uh, those crimes have been detected so far. I should say it was number, the number involving pets in uh, three years ago was 48, went up to 62 years ago, back down to 48 for the last year that we have records. Uh, the dogs have been recovered in two thirds of those uh, cases. So we do feel this is dealt with effectively just now, but as I've said, of course, we'll look to see what the member comes forward with in terms of his bill and take a view on that at the time. Thank you. Question four is not lodged. Question five has been withdrawn. So question six, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what specific training is provided to help serving police officers deal with members of the public who have mental health issues. Cabinet Secretary. Scotland is one of the first police services in the UK to implement mental health and suicide intervention training for all officers, right from probationary constables up to the rank of inspector, benefiting the workforce and the communities they serve. In addition, staff in C3 Division Command Control and Coordination, as a first point of contact, receive training in risk and vulnerability assessment, and staff working in custody suites receive mental health awareness training. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. An increasing number of people who come into contact with Police Scotland do have mental health issues. Following on from the Vision for Justice in Scotland document last year, can the Cabinet Secretary update us on how the Scottish Government will also work with partners to improve the mental and physical health and well-being of people who come into contact with the wider criminal justice system and indeed those who work within it? Cabinet Secretary. It, the Scottish Government recognises that there are significant pressures facing mental health services and the impact that that has on other services, including policing. Uh, and we are working with partners across the health and justice sectors to address these issues. And they're also directly investing in mental health support and services of £290 million in 2023-24. That represents in itself an increase from the updated 2022-23 budget of £252 million following the emergency budget review. We have also provided £250,000 over three years to fund trauma specialists to develop a framework for training staff to create a more trauma-informed and trauma-responsive justice system. I am glad that the member mentioned that in his question because one of the most important aspects of that justice system, although it will probably be the one that gets fewer headlines, is if we are able to manage at the end of that period to have right across the justice system in all its different agencies uh, training uh, having been undertaken, people being informed about how to produce a trauma-informed response, that will be one of the biggest achievements of that vision if we're able to achieve it. And I have committed that Justice Ministers will also be, and I have had training in this already, and I'm sure I'll have further training, so that right across the system we recognise that people that interact with the justice system will very often have suffered trauma in that process, and we don't want to add to that trauma. So again, I would thank the member for his question on this very important area. A couple of supplementaries first. Russell Finlay. Thank you very much. Uh, further to uh, Kenny Gibson's question, Scotland's under pressure police officers have become in some ways a de facto emergency mental health service, which can add to their own mental health pressures. I have been speaking with friends and families of officers who have taken their own lives and those who have survived suicide attempts, and they would like to know what the Scottish Government is doing to help pre prevent more police suicides. 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I have said that the measures which I have already mentioned are also beneficial to police officers themselves, and he will be aware from previous answers I have given in the Chamber about specific support that we have uh, to police officers themselves. But we are also supporting the development of enhanced mental health uh, pathways for those in distress or in need of mental health support, because one of the pressures which uh, Russell Finley quite rightly identifies on police officers is knowing how best to deal and not become further traumatised by dealing with people with mental health uh, issues when they are present to, to the police. Uh, we also have Action 15 of the Scottish Government's Mental Health Strategy, which is a commitment to fund 800 additional mental health workers to increase capacity in key locations where people may need help the most, including police custody suites. And at the end of that commitment, we expect to have 958 0.9, uh, a whole time equivalent mental health posts right across the piece. So I think we're providing additional support and capacity to police officers to help them deal with this uh, admittedly increased situation over recent years uh, and also to make sure that they're able to draw on the resources of the health service as well. And Willie Rennie. Mental health practitioners train for years. They're experts in their own field, but increasingly, as has already been referred to, we rely on police officers to help people with poor mental health, even though they are not the experts, despite the training that the Minister has highlighted. Are we not letting those police officers down by failing to have adequate services elsewhere? But referring to the point he made about the 800 additional uh, professionals helping also in the police service, where are we with that? How many, in terms of numbers, do we have embedded in the police service so that they are working alongside the police to help people with mental health issues? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, on his first point, I would say that we have, uh, first of all, in the emergency department settings, 35.6 uh, whole-time equivalent posts in police custody suites. Uh, police Scotland have been key national partners in the development of the innovative Distress Brief Intervention Programme, the DBI programme, which allows for frontline services a new option for supporting people who present to them in emotional distress but who do not require emergency clinical intervention. Uh, and as it, just for the members' information, as at 30th November 22, DBI has supported over 36,000 people since launch in 2016. Referrals to DBI from Police Scotland account for 9 per cent of that figure. Uh, and up to June uh, 2022, a total of 1,238 Police Scotland staff have taken, undertaken DBI training. I would also mention the redesign of the urgent care programme, which is relevant in this regard. But given the question he's asked about where we're at in terms of the 800-plus uh, figure, uh, because that goes across a whole number of uh, portfolios, I'm happy to write to the member with updated information. Thank you. Question number seven uh, from Stephanie Callahan, who joins us remotely. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made on expanding the use of electronic monitoring for non-violent criminals. Cabinet Secretary. Since the Management of Offenders Scotland Act 2019 was passed, the Scottish Government have procured a new national contract for provision of electronic monitoring services, and we have now commenced the vast majority of the Act. On the 17th of May 2022, we commenced through the Act two new policy uses to allow electronic monitoring as part of bail and to allow use within community payback orders at first disposal. Progress continues to be made towards expanding electronic monit monitoring using a, a broad range of licences and community orders. In the last few months, I have seen a record high in the number of individuals electronically monitored in Scotland. Stephanie Callaghan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that helpful answer, and it's good to hear that progress. Does he agree with me that reducing the amount of non-violent offenders in prison has helped to reduce disruption to children and families who are negatively impacted both emotionally and financially, and that we must continue to make progress in this area? Cabinet Secretary. I certainly do agree that we have to shift the balance between custody and justice in the community as one of our key priorities. And to do so, we need to ensure that the relevant community justice services are available, consistent and of high quality. And that reflects actually a discussion that we had at the Criminal Justice Committee this morning. While funding for community justice services is constrained by the current economic circumstances, we have continued to protect the community justice budget. Additional funding of £11.8 million was provided in 2021 
2022 to bolster capacity and support recovery from the pandemic. That has increased to £15 million this year, including a specific investment of £3.2 million to support bail assessment and supervision services, directly supporting an increase in the provision of bail supervision, with services now running in 30 local authority areas. In total, we invest uh, around £134 million in community justice services, which will be maintained next year as well. And question number eight, Emma Roddick. To ask the Scottish Government how it provides support to victims of violent crime in the pre-trial period. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, victims of violent crime are supported in different ways during the pre-trial period. The Scottish Government, for our part, fund a range of victim support organisations, both generally and for specific crime types, uh, who are then able to engage during this time and provide practical and emotional support. The Victim Information and Advice Service is also available from the Crown Office. Emma Roddick. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. He will be aware that Section 24.5 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 sets out the standard conditions for bail, including that the accused does not behave in a manner which causes or is likely to cause alarm or distress to witnesses. Would he agree with me that where the accused and the victim of a violent crime live in the same building, this condition seems impossible to fulfil failing victims? And would he meet with me to discuss this matter further? Cabinet Secretary. I, I am happy to say, of course, that the member is raising an important issue uh, on behalf of one of our constituents. I hope that she will, though, in turn appreciate I can't comment on the specific decisions made in the criminal courts. But I would add, in general terms, that there are powers for the court to consider further conditions, as it is uh, termed, of bail, which are designed to help compliance with the standard conditions. And further conditions can include things like an accused person having to change address if the court deems it necessary. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, and in relation to the individual case uh, which the member uh, mentions, as I have said, I am not able to publicly comment on individual decisions taken by the courts, but I am happy to meet with the member to understand more about the case which she has raised. And supplementary, Jamie Green. Thank you again. Uh, one of the ways we can support victims is properly enforcing bail conditions and breaches of bail. Uh, Bail-related offences are at a 10-year high. Uh, one in four uh, bail orders uh, granted will go on to be breached. And Victim Support Scotland say that victims often feel as they have to police the bail conditions themselves. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary which bit of his forthcoming bail and release uh, from custody legislation that the Government is bringing forward will deal with those concerns and make sure that bail conditions are properly adhered to and that breaches are severely dealt with? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, we are replaying some of the discussion we had uh, this morning, and I mentioned the fact that I think if we can get bail, uh, the conditions under which bail are approved, onto the terms which are proposed in the bail and release bill, that in itself can uh, help to reduce risk, help to reduce uh, offending whilst on bail, and help to reduce reoffending at the other end of a custodial sentence. So I think we are taking this forward, um, and I think it's also true to say that I've just mentioned, uh, in response to a previous question, the way in which we are increasing have increased this year, will increase next year the resources to local authorities who are often the bail supervision authorities uh, looking after that. So, yes, we have more to do. We have to ensure that increases. But it is also true to say, as I said this morning, that in judging the conviction rates for those on bail to be meaningful also has to be compared with the conviction rates of those who serve a full custodial sentence or who are remanded in custody as well to make sense of uh, how that is affecting the situation. But regardless of that, of course we have to try and minimise the number of convictions committed by those on bail. And I think the track record of the resources we have put in, given the general financial circumstances last year and next year, show that we are very serious about doing that. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions. Then there will be a brief pause before we move to the next item of business.